You know, that's one thing I haven't heard yet today is carbon and soil. And that's a driving force in what we're doing. I don't care what anybody says, that's a driving force, and we've got to really focus on that. You know, and another thing I've learned over the years is you can't make all the mistakes yourself, and I really try to do that. So what I'm saying is team together, you guys, with your neighbor or whatever, and try to learn from each other, because if, whether we realize it or not, we have to change what we're doing. We have got to change what we're doing. We have got to be more sustainable. So we're 9,600 acres and we've been no-till since 1993. We feel like residue is really a friend. We'll do our rotation with heavier residue crops because we need the soil armor, so residue is our friend. We did not take one of wheat out of our rotation because residue is our friend. We've got to have that soil armor. We're 8,500 8, acres of grass on the Missouri River breaks, 850 head of cows, cow-calf pair, and you can see that'll always be a virgin sod, and, and it's a good thing. The boys do a really good job of managing uh, our pastures. They, uh, they rotate them, they've got divide fences. They're doing a tremendously good job with their cattle, and, and it's nothing but a, where I used to think it was kind of a detriment to a farm, and now I think it's, all about our farm is about our cattle because one pays the other one off. So here's our pasture. And the, the bad thing is it's in one chunk. And so when we run into a little dry spell, we get hurt. But then we run into in the winter time, we've got two sections where we bring the cows home to. And so we, so we had an issue. So we're bringing them home, we were grazing them hard, we were losing residue, so we were getting to where our our home two sections, we were losing productivity off of it because we were grazing it too hard in the winter time. And so then as, as the story goes along, I'll tell you how we tried to remedy that. Okay, so I don't know how many of you guys have read uh, Howard Buffett's book, 40 Chances. So what he's saying in this book is you've got 40 chances in your life to make a difference. Just think about that. You're a farmer, maybe you've already used 20. So you've got 40 chances to really make a difference in your life. So I've already used 48. <laughs> but see, what, what I'm ashamed of, embarrassed of, and what I'm trying to make better is the first 24 years, I completely destroyed this soil. Then what Dave was talking about in the 70s, I lived the 70s. I mean, it was, I did, we did everything we could do to destroy the soil and we didn't know any better. And I'm not so sure that isn't what's happening right now. So much to do in so little time. To me, that's my main goal, is what I want to do is if I can influence people to do the right thing, that's a win-win situation for me. <clears throat> so in the 70s, we were good farmers. We felt we were the better farmers around. We, our cover crop was wild buckwheat, buckwheat and kosher weed, and, and uh, we didn't really understand anything. All we knew was we were so busy working, so busy knowing, doing we were doing the right thing, tilling the ground, working the ground. Uh, after harvest, you'd go out there and you'd, you'd uh, plow it or, or disc it. When Dave said there, when you started plowing, you kept plowing until the color of the soil changed. What we'd do was, I mean, actually, you guys, in the time that we plowed, we, we were plowing six inches deep and then all of a sudden we went to five because we were turning up yellow dirt. We didn't understand why. But uh, so we were our own worst enemies. The worst two pieces of machinery you can use, this one's terrible, cuts all the macropores off. We had to go to, we, had, we finally went to buckwheat because, or, or noble blaze because our buckwheat was so bad. We couldn't get through our stubble because the buckwheat was so bad. Right now we don't have any buckwheat on our farm. With our rotations, we pretty well take care of it. So farming in the 80s. So you'd go along and every time the wind blew, if you were in town or if you were someplace, you were afraid to look like to us it'd be the west because there'd be dirt in the air. And we were just so, we just were so afraid it would be us that we just, go home, we wouldn't go out and look because there wasn't a lot you could do about it. <clears throat> but we still thought we were good farmers. So 
we didn't have really good, uh, we didn't really have really good yields, but we thought we, we thought we did. One thing about the corn, this 70 bushel, we'd never plant corn with over three miles away from the farm because we knew we were going to have to cut it for silage. We knew it wouldn't make corn. So we'd always be close to the house. And then another thing is uh, this was on, on, on Black Summer Fellow. And we thought we were good farmers. So our, our organic matter really, you know, it was going down. And then we started using some fertilizer. And, and you talk about a response. You talk about a response. First, we started using phosphorus in 50-pound bags. And then we went to some nitrogen. And, we had one drill with, the, with uh, fertilizer, open, or fertilizer attachment and the other, and we didn't. But you talk about a response. So we thought we had this deal figured out. You know, I just compared uh, rainfall here. Alexander, you know, they get about 37, uh, where am I at? 24, about 25 inches, and we get 19.6. The only thing is, you guys are a little bit warmer. But then look at this year. There's not a lot of difference, is there? This isn't all, this isn't our whole county. But see, the thing like with us, you take our snow away, and we had 17.3 inches of, of moisture this year, and you guys had 18.1. So one thing about this whole thing, with this snow, were you able to capture it? Did you have the residue stand in? Did you not use the, the knife rollers? Did you leave that residue stand to catch that snow? A lot of guys say you're too wet, and I think with the no-till and, and, uh, and a high uh, diversity and rotation, I think you can handle that, make it different. So this is Powder County, so it's just like anything, and I'm sure it's the same way the county is here. See the difference in the rainfalls? So there's our place, there's the main farm, but see, there's our river, there's our pasture. 13 inches of rain down there this year. I mean, so the, the boys and their, their, the native grass and their pasture rotations are, are bringing us through, but it's, it's an issue. Okay, this is how it all changed, Dwayne Beck. You know, I'm very fortunate enough to be on Dakota Lakes Board, and I'm very fortunate enough to be on Soil, South Dakota Soil Health Coalition Board. Dwayne's the one that started this. The only reason Dwayne, we were the first ones in our area to start no-till. We had 750s, and we didn't know what we were doing with Dwayne's lead, but I mean, you talk about someone, you didn't have places like this to go to say, what am I going to do? We didn't have, we were really struggling with rotations, we, uh, we just, uh, it was a struggle, but you can't put a value on what it's done for our area. And when I say no-till, I mean low residue no-till. As far as I'm concerned, a shank drill will do quite a bit of damage. I'm talking about a disc drill. You know, there's a lot of no-till captures carbon and organic matter, which is full of nutrients. So yes, a tillage pass will release those nutrients, causing a crop response. But then you are back to square one. It's like burning your house, your house for heat. You did get some heat, but you destroyed your house. So basically, you're not capturing that carbon. All the carbon you plant took in, you go work it, whatever, and the way that carbon goes in the air. There's a lot of truth to that, you guys. We have to focus on carbon. There's no question in my mind you have to focus on carbon. <clears throat> so we were looking for ways to fertilize. We had 750 drills and on, and, and so we tried spreading urea. And we, do, we really didn't like that because we knew we were volatizing, we knew we were losing some fertilizer, and you're always, you, you, there was a lot of times they're having to uh, spread when they had time instead of when it should have been done. So then we went to anhydrous. And you can see why we didn't like anhydrous, see what it did to the soil. Anytime you do that, you're going to release carbon. Then another thing, you're going to lose that so soil armor. And we had to have that soil armor. So this is how we do our wheat, and there's a reason I'm going to tell you on uh, how, why we put our fertilizer down. So we have an 1895 drill, so the fertilizer will go, the nitrogen will go five inches away from the seed, and then, uh, but 
the reason when you do that, when it's five inches away, four, five inches away from the seed, at the fourth week, fourth leaf, the nitrogen and fertilizer will get together. And when it does that, then that's how you can control your tillering. So basically what you're doing, instead of like having five tillers if it's broadcast, we want, about, we want about two and a half good heads, between two and two and a half of good heads per kernel of wheat. We don't want to grow straw, we want to grow heads of wheat. So that really helped. Another thing about the 1895, the first one that John Deere built went to Ralph Holsworth. He's a neighbor. He started no-tilling the year before we did. It went to, he lives a mile or three miles west of us, and, and drill number two went to our farm. So that's how much we believe that we're in this system. And then uh, we'll put down, we'll put down 1152 and we'll do some potash and AMS with our starter and the potash, we want the chloride for soil health. And then we come back at stream bar. I know Dave said that with us, we have to have protein. We have got to have quality. We have to assure ourselves of quality. So what we'll do is we'll put enough on and then we'll come back the way the weather is timing the weather, whatever and ever, and then we'll come back and stream bar at about Ficus 5. Because in our environment, we have got to have protein. If we do not have protein, uh, like on spring wheat, if we don't have 14 protein, uh, it's just about feed. It'll cost you a dollar a bushel. So this is our a field of no-till, uh, long-term no-till sunflower stocks, and you can see our residue. I mean, you can't say enough good things about our residue, but so there's quite a bit of that around. So that was in central South Dakota in 2007, just a little bit little, what, too far from our place. That came off a sunflower field. So we got to stop this. We know how to stop this. Well, here's 2012. That's four miles from my place. That was a bean field that they planted to spring wheat and then it blew. There's quite a bit of that where they'll put fertilizer on bean stubble in the fall and then it'll blow. So, you know, we got over that. We won't let that happen again. Whoops, we did. You know, that's organic matter there. This is a, this is a high no-till environment and that's what manage will do, management will do. We've got to pay attention to that. Everybody's got to pay attention to that. We can't let that happen. So, you know, and this is, Dwayne helped us with this. We, so what do we do? So here's an 1895 drill. These are 10 inches apart. So, and then, so all we did, and this isn't a very good picture, but see, we just took and put the wheel over here, wheel over there, so then you've got a row of stock standing right here. We did, uh, we did that on both sides of the drill on the wings, and that was enough. So what our fields look right now, that's what our fields look like, and that was enough to stop the blowing. <clears throat> if, you, if we have enough residue, we won't blow, but that's enough to stop the blowing. So our row crop fertilizer, we'll, we put, uh, we, on the river we do a little different, but on our dry land, our, our urea will go, uh, uh, three inches off the side and two inches down and we'll put our starter with the, with the, uh, the seed. And I'm gonna, there's a, I'm coming to this why we're doing this. So if you broadcast urea on top of the soil, the urea enzyme will break it down and that's where you get, it will release it and get your volatilization. So, but if it's under the ground, it'll help it, it'll slow it down. So this is my theory, and it's just a theory. So Colton, and you can Google it, this was in the Furl Magazine, I've read quite a bit about this, so what they claim is you, if you pack it, if you pack that urea into a tight deal, it'll, it'll slow down the urea system and, and make it a slow release. And I really, I really feel that's working for it. So you say, what's your benefit abandon? Someone will say, well, you can cut back. Someone will say, well, you know, because it's close to the seed. And I, you know, and this is my thought, and I'll get into a little more of what, uh, how I'm beginning to believe this all the time. A lot of you guys have probably read this book. If you don't have this book, you get this book. 84 pages long. Don't only get it, but get one to give to your neighbor also. Good book. 
Much of modern agronomy is focused on feeding plants the nutrients they need to grow for a harvestable crop. Very little is said about the most limited element most needed for crop production, that is carbon. We've got to have carbon. We've got to have carbon. <clears throat> so right now, you put, on your, you put on your inorganic fertilizer and you plant a plant. So that plant's on welfare. Most of the time what a plant will do is they'll take in through photosynthesis, they'll take in, they'll take out, and they'll take the, car the sugar out, and then the, the fungi will take it, and then they'll go get the organic uh, nitrogen. So what happens when it does this is it's, got, it's on welfare, so it's gonna use that or inorganic nitrogen, and it's gonna get lazy. I mean, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you use that if you could? How many people, if you, had, if you had free meals given to you, why would you have to go work? So that's exactly what the plant's doing. So then when it comes time for the plant to actually say, well, I'm running out of that uh, inorganic fertilizer, I need some more. So it goes and it sends sugar out to try to get the attention of the mycorrhizae and the, and the bacteria to go after and get the organic in. So instead of taking everything to the head, it's taken everything it's got to try to go after more fertilizer. So I'm not saying we should quit fertilizing. I'm not saying I think we, we need to watch what we fertilize and maybe manage our fertilizer a little better. But one thing I'm really is, I, one thing, and in the, in the, I, I, there's no scientific deal, this is just a farmer's thought. I think when you put that fertilizer in a tight band like that, I think part of this is helping, where it's actually going off and finding, it's not being overwhelmed with that uh, uh, inorganic fertilizer. We soil sample, we variable rate, we do our own, I've been doing it since 2000. And the main reason we do this is because not, to, not for most production, we're just finding out what the fields need. And I think the last thing we, uh, on our farm right now, we don't farm for max, uh, maximum yield. We farm for maximum profit. And when we started doing that, that made a lot of difference because, you know, if you're not, you're gonna be going for them 180 bushel yields and you might get them one out of 10 years and we take an average and, so we don't do that anymore. We farm for maximum profit. So you put all them together, you got a variable rate map. Again, same thing, cost efficient management. It's, it's, and I think you really have to do that. Our feeling that's really taken us a long ways on our farm. Here's another thing, Dwayne, quit putting Band-Aids on things. When you have something wrong, Instead of just trying to find out some way to, well, how am I going to heal this? Or let's see, I need, I need to go buy another fungicide. That'll take care of this. Or they've got a new herbicide, and I know I got to spray that herbicide. What you do is you go find out what the problem is, what the issue is. And it took me a while. I'm a slow learner. So I thought, well, this is where we need to be. And the reason, these were the first rotations we started with. And the reason this was is because before the freedom to farm, we had to, we had to plant our wheat base. The only way we could plant our wheat base is plant winter wheat back on spring wheat. So, and so, I mean, we thought we had it made. Well, the only thing that someone else was thinking, the cheatgrass said, you know, I'm gonna figure you guys out. So we went, we went two times around on this, two and a half times around, and we realized we had to make a change. We could either spray for cheatgrass and keep fighting the cheatgrass, or we had to let rotations do it. And, and our goal was to do it with rotation. So these aren't any big deals. We just, all we did was we stayed uh, two years away from, uh, or three years away from wheat. I mean, but, but doing this, we still, that's the reason we were doing it. But in the long run, what it was really doing was getting us more diversified and helping us with soil health. And then we started cover crops in 2006. These are our crops raised in 2017. And uh, I know we've got forage crops in there, but uh, one thing we'll do is we'll go look for the markets. But you can see our high residue crop, we value residue. In our dry environment, we 
uh, we value residue, have to have residue. <clears throat> if you ever want to read something interesting, just Charles Darwin on worms. I mean, you can read for hours about what his, what he, what's his thoughts were on worms, earthworms. This is a field of, it was volunteer lentils this fall. And you know, when you, the lentils were short anyway, and, and uh, when your full feeding rate's 40 pounds, so it wasn't anything to leave 30, 40 pounds because they shattered, they're only six inches tall, eight inches tall. But look at the, look at the earthworm holes. Is water gonna go down? Is water gonna go down? Is risk got a place to go? Risk got a place to go. But another thing, with earthworm channels, there's two and a half times more uh, nitrogen. There's a one and a half more er, carbon, one and a half more times nitrogen, seven times more phosphorus, and six and a half times more potash. So if you were a plant, you're in a drier environment, and you, had a, you said, well, where am I gonna go? Well, here's an easy place, and when I go down there, I'm gonna have all that fertility. I'm gonna have all that fertility that the earthworms created. You know, the NRCS has done a lot of work on our farm, and, and uh, along with SDSU, I don't wanna give one, anybody one more credit than the other, but you know, the more you read, the more you realize it's what's under the soil. Everybody drives by and say, boy, that's a nice corn crop. Boy, that's a nice wheat crop. How many times do you say, boy, let's go take a spade and go look at that soil? I mean, I think we have to do that, you guys. I think we have to, because soil's a driving force in what's gonna happen in the future. So we took uh, Shannon Osborne and Mike Lehman asked us, told us we could bring some some uh, uh, soil samples over to the lab, and it was 2012, extremely dry. And I said, I don't think it'll do any good because we're dry. I mean, we're just terribly dry, and it was the uh, middle of winter, February, well, February 14th. Guess what else I did on Valentine's Day? But anyway, so <laughs> anyway, and this is, this is how little like, that I know about it, so I was so proud of taking this one. Because look at the rotation, I mean, holy buckets. I mean, there wasn't any way that thing wasn't gonna be a, a, you know, a big rotation, and it was the least count. So it just kind of shows you how little we know about what's going on under our feet. But the one thing that really helped me is everything was still alive. When you warmed it up under a microscope, it was still alive. And I just thought that meant a lot. So mycorrhizae, uh, mycorrhizae fungi, if you guys ever get it, all, you read everything you can about it because that thing's helping us so much. It's been around forever, but the, it, uh, it moves in from legume plants. The start of fertilizer is reduced, uh, destroying the, the food web by tillage. I mean, that'll hurt it. <clears throat> it can access water from very small pores in the soil bringing the water to the plants during times when the soil is dry. When we were in Indianapolis with Dr. Ray Wells had a talk, and it was all the talk on, on what his talk was is on the mycorrhizae, the rooting structure of a mycorrhizae. And he's got pictures of mycorrhizae where it'll go in aggregation. When you get aggregated soils that look like cottage cheese, that's the glomona from the, it's from the sugar that the mycorrhizae takes to the center of that, and then that's what makes it it's sticky. And then that's, but anyway, he has pictures of where it's right, and it will go right, right in the center of that, and then that's where it, it'll take most, of the, it'll go after most of the moisture. But it, I thought it was kind of neat. So we put a, we had a forage soybeans, and then we, we planted corn and we came back. We did this two years, and one year I took it to harvest, and the other year, year we cut it for silage. And so what we, do, what we did was we uh, came back and we planted the corn and came back about right when the corn was spiked and planted some forage soybeans, group sevens. You know, and the, the thing that was really stuck out at me is 
so these are the, the, this is the corn with the soybeans. And we thought we were running, it was a drought, but you see the tips of these, that corn how it's tipped back. So basically them forage soybeans were feeding the nitrogen. In our limited rainfall, we have to be careful with this because then forage soybeans took quite a bit of moisture. But it's just something we kind of have to be careful of. You know, this is another thing, Dr. Dave Francine. We plant flax, I love flax. But it's mycorrhizae friendly. Flax doesn't take any, and he'll, he, he would have told you that today, that's in his book. It doesn't take any phosphorus because the mycorrhizae goes after their organic phosphorus. If you could get him to say it, and we should ask him today, he'll tell you that sunflowers don't take any phosphorus. He don't recommend any phosphorus to sunflowers. And if you would ask him, is it mycorrhizae? And he probably would have said yes, because sunflowers are very mycorrhizae. Love them in a cover crop mix. There would be sufficient length of mycorrhizae hyphae in the top four inches of a four square yard of healthy grassland to stretch around the world. There's a lot to this. I mean, you guys, I really encourage you to read about it because the more you read about it, the more you plant mycorrhizae plants, and there's a lot of them, just realize the value of them. Okay, now we're gonna get into carbon. We were at a meeting in 1991, and Dwayne Beck said, do you see what I see? And he was talking about carbon. It blew over the top of my head. It only took me 20 years to figure it out. But it's, you guys, the more you, the more you realize we have to take carbon in, not only take carbon in, but we have to store it. 57% of organic matter is carbon. We have to take carbon in. That's the biggest thing about you. Carbon's a driving force. Anytime you can grow, bring it in through the plants, you've got to have carbon. Another thing we're doing is we're working some native uh, grass and our, nothing big, but you know, it's kind of a rotation type deal, kind of slough area, some hunting area. We'll put 60 acres in, leave it in four or five years and take it out again. We're getting our root structure. We're getting, we're bringing that land back. I mean, we're bringing it back to where it was. So when we, then we will take it back to a crop, but I just think that's really gonna help us in the long run. Jay Fuhrer, think the world of Jay. This is a Craig Cronin, that's Mike's son. He's gonna be one of the, the main owners. The, the farm's shifting gears next year it, it, and uh, Casey and Corey, that's Monty's two sons, and Mike and Trey, it's going to, Monty's stepping out of the picture. Uh, he's going to retire, which is, you know, fine. But anyway, I really believe that. If you have more carbon entering your soil than leaving, your kids will probably farm that land. If you have more carbon leaving than entering, they probably will not. What he's saying is you've got to farm for the future. So we had some corn and heavy stripper stubble in 2017, nice looking corn. Oh geez, we had a frost June 26th. Was it gonna come back? I don't know if it was gonna come back. It was really, it was probably six collar plus. The thing that is out of that, we'd have 160 acres and we, we lost maybe 80 acres out of the quarter, but it was being the low ground. Didn't know how to make any sense of it. So we knew we had to do something. We weren't gonna leave that land alone because it had the fertility there. It wanted something growing in it. So we planted, you can't see it very well, but we planted a pearl millet because that's what the chemical let me, had Callisto on it, and brown midrib forage sorghum because we had cows. Because we had cows. Here's what we ended up with. I should have done a biomass. Unreal. Unreal what we did. And to show you, uh, Ruth came up, Ruth Beck, and 
And I shouldn't have to say Ruth Beck. I should be able to say Ruth, and everybody knows her because she's up. But anyway, Ruth came up and Jason, and we went out there, you guys, and it was, it was really something. It, it was really felt like a success story. So what we did is we had the, you know, so what are you gonna, how are you going to handle it now? So we went in with the side. Now, this is our better soils. So we knew we had the fertility there. We knew our organic matter was a little higher there. We knew that uh, we had, still had good ground cover. You saw that on the picture. So what do you do? So we cut up for silage. And you say, boy, you took all that stuff off, but you know that was terrible. Well, I understand, but we had to do what we had to do. So we took the silage off, but I kept thinking, look at all the root mass we have. Look at the root mass we'd have with that. It, it probably down three, three foot, two and a half, three foot. So I felt, I, I, I didn't want to take it all off, but it's something in the way the, the temperature was, or the weather was, the rainfall, we felt we had to. So here's another thing about if we need cover or not. So look at the temperature. Look at the temperature when you start, the, start evaporating. 85% of the moisture lost through evaporation and transpiration at 95 degrees. So what happens on bare soils? You know, if you guys ever done much of this, it doesn't take very much to go out with a thermometer and get 100, 110 degree soil on bare soil. So this is just uh, one of them things, and this is, isn't my picture, the NRCS. My thermometer sideways, and it's hard to take a picture, but look at the difference. Same day, same place. These came from Jay Fuhrer. We have to have that soil armor. We have to have that soil covered. So here's where organic matter, when we started taking off, I mean, uh, so it's building and we felt good about it and it, we're no tilling and you know you feel you know we're going in the right direction because if we would not have I don't know where we would have been because when you the, the microbes are going to eat something and they're going to eat organic matter if they don't have anything any carbon that you brought in so they're going to eat something so this is 10 percent is where we used to be we're let, a lot of places in the United States are less than two. What do you think that grandpa's telling his grandson? I'm sorry. When we were in Indiana uh, with the Buffett people, we had people from the, the, the thumb of Michigan, and we had from the Boot Hill, Missouri, from Nebraska to Indiana to Iowa. And a lot of guys, you talk about organic matter, they didn't want to really talk about organic matter. But when they did talk, a lot of them were in the one and a half to twos, the two and a halves. They're trying to do it all with, they're getting into cover crops now, that's what they should. But because they've got to get carbon back to make organic matter. They're trying to do it with the inorganic uh, nutrients. So this is what we've done on our farm. And so what I did was I took a, that grass was planted in the 30s. It was planted back in the 30s, so I took a soil sample of it. I should have gone to native, but so it was 5.1. An average land in 2008 was 2.8, and we have a lot of land in the fours right now. What I'm gonna say about cover crops, anytime you get a cover crop going on your field, I mean, I'm talking a pretty active cover crop where everything's really perking well, I think, you know, I used to say if you could gain a tenth of a percent a year, you're doing well, and I think you can get to two tenths or maybe even three tenths a year by use of a cover crop. I think cover crop is just going to jumpstart that soil. One thing, too, is, and Jay talked about a lot, is when you plant covers, don't be disappointed after the first year because he, he explains it kind of like a soybean, where the second year soybean is always better than the first year native. And he says, it's just something about it because when you plant a cover on that stubble, it's just kind of a shock to it because it's had stuff it's never had before, but it's always better the second time around. So all I'm really saying to you guys is just this, this ain't just a one or two year deal. We just gotta have to keep working on this. Benefits, uh, 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. The one I, pay attention to the most is your organic matter, water holding capacity. In our drier environment, that's tremendously important. 
If I can hold another half or three quarters inch of water, that's gonna get me through that tough time. Time and time again, it shows that. Mineralization, this fall we really, you know, we just, everybody said, boy, I can't believe we've got that much nitrogen. Well, all it is is, is the microbes are really working and they're working on the organic matter and whatever, whatever, but the more organic matter you have, the more mineralization you're gonna have. <clears throat> this is our, where our organic matter is going now, and that's, uh, I feel good about that. I just hope we can keep, the one thing about it is we're not going backwards. I do not take credit for organic matter in any soil test. I will not. 1% of organic matter is like 1.1 trillion waters a gallon per day over Niagara Falls, 1% over the United States. That's how much water that 1% of organic matter could hold. It's our savings account. When we fertilize for 140 and you can have a good moisture and get 160, how do you get that? You get it from your organic matter. But Dave Francine says, just like on the, and he just came out with this on his corn deal, if you have 6% organic matter or over, he'll credit. He won't credit until you get 60%. He sees the value of organic matter. So like when he talks about fertilizing wheat, which I'm not saying, I, I don't, I'm a farmer, I don't, have, I don't have enough knowledge or education to disagree with Dr. Francine, but I don't, I, I don't really believe that because what he's saying, he, he's gonna fertilize for two bushel wheat, and if he gets rain, the organic matter is gonna kick in. The only thing is, is what if you don't have 5% organic matter? What if you're two and a half? And so I think, uh, I think, uh, I, I really think that's critical that you, that's why we won't use any organic matter credit. We do, but we don't, we don't use it as credit, but we do use our organic matter. <clears throat> this is on the internet, $600, $680 for 1% of organic matter. And I just put some of our own numbers in And you still, there's really still quite a value to 1% of organic matter. If you own your land, if you own your own land, why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you trying to get more organic matter? Everybody says I'm too hot, too dry, whatever, whatever, but optimum management and add an external carbon source. Anytime you can, anytime you can. Cover crops, you guys. This is our first cover crop. Dwayne, you know, he was going, he was trying to get someone to try cover crops and he got me kind of cornered and so we did it. The only thing is, is uh, it, we come off a really dry year. We had 13.7 inches of moisture, but the, uh, it was really a low carbon, only a 20 to one carbon and, and uh, I was worried about it and he was worried about it enough. He called one day and he said, when are you gonna start combining that? And I said, well, we're probably gonna be doing it Tuesday and Tuesday morning he pulled in and he rode with me. So he was as nervous as I was, but it turned out pretty good for us. We ended up with good moisture in 2007, but it, it, it turned out for us. So another question, so we're gonna plant cover crops. There's not enough people, a lot of people, what they'll do is, they'll, and I'm not, I think there's a tremendous lot of good seed salesmen. I, I hope I don't offend anybody, but when you walk up to your seed salesman, you say, this is what I wanna do. I wanna graze it. I wanna increase organic matter. I, it, you know, whatever you wanna do, you wanna use up the excess moisture, whatever you wanna do, you have them goals. And usually what I do when I sit down to make my, my uh, uh, cover crop plans, I have three things in mind. If it's grazing, organic matter, would it be one, two, three? I always have my first one, but don't just go up there and say, I need a cover crop. They can help you, they know what you want, but you let them know what you want. This is from the NRCS, Jason Miller and, and Jeff Hemingsway made this, and it's a good chart, and, and what I usually do, let's just take flax, for instance. So, 
you know, it's high, highly mycorrhized. I, it's good, um, you know, and it tells you it's, it's fair to, with organic matter, carbon to ni nitrogen ratio high. But so one thing too, is you look at the seeding rate, full seeding rate, 20 pounds. So when I make a cover crop mix, if I got five things, and, I, and so I, that five things will be like, I want, so I, I'll, I'll do 20% of each one. So right now, that'd be four pounds of flax. And that's how I build my cover crop mix. So do a percentage. If you feel really good about it, if you've got enough moisture, I sometimes go to 115 to 120%. That's, that's the way, I, I'm not saying it's the right way, it's just the way I do it. Another thing, Chris mentioned this. This is on the Google cover crop chart, ARS, and you can go and it'll tell you anything you wanna know about any cover crop, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, everything salt tolerant, good website. <clears throat> One thing I found in the SARE book, and I started doing this because when we plant Sorghum sedan grass, we always plant Piper sedan grass. I never plant one thing alone. Piper sedan grass and probably like a, a, either a white, a white wonder or a, a German millet. Because I never want anything alone. I think that everybody gets along better when there's something else there. Then another thing about that millet is it keeps the wind real fluffy. And, but the one thing that really, just look at that. So if you, and we've seen this six inch stubble, look how much deeper the roots go. More root mass, more, uh, it, it takes in more carbon, the more benefit the so soil microbes. I mean, if a guy has cattle, I mean, I think this is a win-win. Carbon to nitrogen ratio, so, you know, one time Dwayne was up and I was talking about all our high carbon crops and all the stubble we had, and, and he made the comment to me, he said, but you have to learn to manage that. That's a high management. And, and I thought, well, you know, anybody could, but it is. I mean, is eight inches of stubble, it's okay, but is it too much? So you just have to kind of realize what you want to do with your cover crop or with your or, or soil cover with your carbon. But one thing, you, you have to be awful careful that you don't use it up and you leave some. Right now, like on our lentils and peas, where a lot of guys will go on corn stalks, I'll plant them on, sun, on spring wheat stubble. Okay, so I've got spring wheat stubble, then lentils, and then, I'll, and then I'll come back to corn, corn or winter wheat. For one thing, it's the weed control. If I've got a cheat grass issue, downy brome issue, behind the spring wheat, the lentils, I can take anything out I want as far as grass is concerned and then I can come back to winter wheat the next year and then corn. So I just take a break. I don't have any set rotations. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, it's just something that works for us. Carbon to nitrogen ratio. So like that one we said was right here on that first cover crop, ideal is right here. And I don't know, on our, we're, our soils are so active with the mature soil, so I like to be a little higher than that. And we started working covers into our pivots, covers and rotations, because I thought this is really an important thing, as we were the corn bean guys, we were kind of caught up in that, and that was the best thing we ever did, was get, was get rid of that corn bean, corn bean, corn bean. We got rid of our white mold issue. I mean, you talk about a win-win situation. So we plant a lot of different crops down there. You know, and I've heard the comment today, how do you make money on wheat? How do you make money on oats? You plant a cover behind them. You put your cattle on there. So we had a, we, we had a pivot that was uh, field peas and we planted a full season cover in 2016. And the boys always pasture wean. So what they'll do is they'll take the, They'll, they'll, along the river, they'll take the cows on one side of the fence and the calves on the other. The calves will stay next to the river where they're used to drinking out of, and then they'll, then they'll just leave them like that. Well, this year what they did, so it was a, we planted a 10-way mix. That snow in the air, these are the calves. So what they did is they put the pears in, and then after about seven days, they took the cows out 
and the calves didn't have any idea what happened. They just, they were so satisfied. They didn't care whatever. But the one thing that really noticeable about that, usually we bring the cows home about the 15th of September, the calves home about the 15th of September. And this year, we, that year they didn't have to because this is like the 7th of November and them calves are still there and they're still doing good. There's no dust, there's, there's plenty of grazing. So I, that was really a, and we're gonna try to copy that again. Uh, we got two pivots kind of set up for that purpose this coming year. So this is the, we planted the corn in 2017 and this is a heavy gumbo circle, heavy, heavy soil. When I broke them the circles back in 70, I don't know, 77 or 78 with the disc, the, there was two circles side by side, 140 acre circle, and this circle was virgin sod. The homesteaders knew enough not to farm this. So we always struggled with raising the crop, always struggled. So then we got into no-till and we really helped ourselves. This is the second time this field's had covers on it and it's responding. It's getting so we can manage it now. We're getting good yields. We had 220 plus on it this year. But this is something I'd like to be able to do it again, and I don't know how, but this is the volunteer cover from the year before. The cattle stomp the oats and the radishes and the turnips in five minutes. Okay, I'll have to hustle. Uh, but, they, uh, but it really is a win-win situation for the cattle. So we started in 2016, I said, well, let's, I think we can make more money raising a full season cover crop than what we can plant in wheat. And I, so we, my goal was is, so we planted June 6th into Teff's double, really diversified mix. So you can see the one thing I really focused on is our mycorrhizae. Everything I put in there had a, had a reason to put it in there. I wanted a 32 to one ratio carbon to nitrogen. So we'll just follow that through. So this is our, this is a quarter section. We left some in free strips. I put a three way in just to see what, if a three way would be rather than a 12 way. Put 50 pounds in at planting and, and you know, I, I didn't know if I should really do that or not. And, and Jay Fuhrer said he didn't think a guy should. And then this is where our cross fences went when we fed during the winter time. So that we, uh, so the different paddocks. June 29th, you can see the in free strips. So full season, that's a hard picture to see, but I love kale, kale will last way into the winter. So here's what, we, what happened. And so this is what we ended up with with most of the field. 8,200 pounds of biomass, we're down to 25 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. But uh, you know, 11% protein. You can see that how much more we gained from with the no in. Though no in earlier we had 7,600, but it really fell off because the young succulent plants gave out with the cold weather. So this is just the relative feed value. So what I did is, is I said, okay, let's find out what we're gonna do here. So I wanted to know, I knew how much it cost us. I knew what I wanted to save. We went ahead and I tracked all the, the temperatures and what the cattle should eat. There's a 650 head eaten there. But one thing I didn't really count on, we had a lot of snow and then we, had, we got really cold. And uh, so in the long run, we had to feed, we fed a fourth of our feeding through the wagon. Was it really a, a win? It was still a win. Did we make as much money as we thought we did? No, we didn't. But the big, it really showed up this year coming off that full season cover. We wintered 150 head of deer and kind of waiting for the game fish and parks to pay us for that one, but I guess we'll wait a while. <laughs> so uh, Jason and Ruth and Jose and Dwayne set up a plot plan. And this is kind of a, so this is 28%. And then the rest of this is seeded this way with their planter. So here's what we come up with, or they came up with. I'm just here for the, I can say I did it, but they're all here, so I better not. But one thing I really thought was, so right now you take the one with, the one with uh, uh, no side, side band in was 181 bushel. No side band in was 149. With, side, with more nitrogen, it was less. So we put the stream bar on the 2nd of May, 
46 degrees temperature, humidity 74%, but it was uh, seven days before we had a quarter inch of rain. Was that the reason? I used stream bars, so I didn't want to spread it out. I wanted to have a stream bar come down so the urea was slow and, and uh, breaking it down. So, it, I mean, it just really showed us a lot of things. And you'll talk to Jason, Dwayne, Ruth, or anybody, and usually your yields are 10 to 12% more when you hand harvested. These were hand harvested. So they're usually more, they were dried down to 8%. This is official as you could get. It's just like wheat, the more nitrogen, the more protein. But look at here, so everybody says, boy, I've got to, I, I, there's not such a thing as putting too much nitrogen on. Look what it did. 100, 180 pounds of nitrogen, 176 bushel. That's 60 pounds of nitrogen, look what it cost us, nine bushel. 11 bushel, but so anything, and the thing of it is on this field, we're gonna go back on that same spot and they're gonna do that same thing. They're gonna replicate the same exact spot. Everything's gonna be the same. We're gonna have three or four of these trials around the farm. We have to find out if we should be using one or 1.2. Everybody's gonna be different. We're not gonna use 1.2, but we have to find out if we can use, in our environment with our system, we gotta find out if we can use a, eight tenths of a pound or nine tenths of a pound. So this is a, the one thing, this we did a strip with uh, starter, different rates of starter, but one thing I want you to notice, so this was soil sampled in the spring before we planted corn. And you'll see this time and time again. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about it. After a cover, after a cover later in the year, you'll get a, a spike in your phosphorus. And this here might have been a fluke. The only thing is that I'd a lot rather see it 4.4 than 3.8. So I mean, at least there's an increase. I'm gonna get hollered out again here. So this is, what it, this is basically how our plots turned out. So there wasn't, there wasn't any significant difference. Send it to Ward Lab, there's 388 pounds of organic phosphorus in that soil. The mycorrhizae went and looked after, went and got that organic phosphorus. This test right here is a, is a $12.50 test at Ward Lab, if you want to find out your total phosphorus in the field. So full season grazing, we're gonna do the same thing. The only thing is I'm gonna maybe try to increase the, the carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's gonna be a dry. So we, we soil sample, or excuse me, we planted covers and a lot of talk was as covers were negative. So uh, we had this field side by side. There, this did not have cover. They were just 16 rows apart. And so we went, so I soil sampled it in, the, uh, in, in November 16 before the corner is nine pounds where there wasn't cover, there's 38 pounds. So I came back and we soil sampled it after corn harvest and we had 89 pounds and here we had 38. So it gave it back to us. It just didn't give it back to us in time for the, the cattle. I soil, I fertilize this accordingly. So this is a, the, our cover crop mix is kind of a, there's a reason in that, but I, I went to that mix. But this is what I, the, so we ended up with a, a no cover was 160, with cover is 156. So you take all, it cost you $26 when I credit ourselves back for the residual end. And all I'm saying is you can't say anything off a of side by side. This shouldn't even be shown. You've got to be replicated. You've got to be replicated three times. Value of it. This is what our corn, you know, this is, these are three years, these are three years. All I'm trying to say is I know the corn varieties gets part of that. But look at there, 1994, 19.5, 2016, 18.8. Are we going in the right direction? This is what is kind of scares me a little bit. Look at the amount of grass that came out in Powder County. Look at the amount of beans over 2006 to 2017. Corn went up. Look at the winter wheat, and the winter wheat's gonna be less. Winter wheat's gonna be down there around 12,000 this year. The T yield on beans is 38 bushel. The beans are gonna be way over here. So then we'll look at Davidson County. Look how much you guys took away from pasture. 
Increased soybeans some, corn some, your, your wheat's dropping. Corn requires nine inches of moisture for vegetative growth, adds 10 bushel for each additional inch. So a yield goal 140 pounds. How can you do that? How can you reach that? And it's organic matter. We use some of our savings account. 58% of organic matter is carbon, low disturbance, no-till. There's a lot of reasons. We need to learn to farm for the maximum profit, not the maximum yield. Let the soil help you with that. You know, a great deal of carbon that once was stored in the soil is now stored in the atmosphere, and it's there, you guys. All we have to do is learn to get it. And, uh, and we desperately need to return the carbon back to humus. This is really makes you feel good because right here, look at the youth on our farm. And everybody says, uh, everybody says, boy, you guys got a lot of people on the farm. Well, it's, it's, three of these aren't ours, but you got a lot of people on the farm. And, but everybody's getting along fine. We're making it work, and we're not real big, but we're making it work, and just because we're, we're trying to make the, we're taking care of the soil, and the soil's taking care of us. You know, this is something that change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. Just think about that. I feel we should do everything we can to make this a better world, and why, who cares? And just this picture is going to tell the story. I'm not going to say anything about it. I don't think we have a choice. OK, thank you, guys. Sorry, I took a little. Sorry. <laughs>